Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our second webinar in the Invasive Species Centre Asian Carp Canada series. My name is Christine Pinkney, and I'm the Asian Carp Project Coordinator here at the Invasive Species Centre. The Invasive Species Centre has partnered with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada to develop this Asian Carp Project, and these webinar series are part of that coordination. The Invasive Species Centre is, is a national, non-governmental organization that builds partnerships, identifies priorities, and supports projects to protect Canada from the damaging effects of invasive species. It also, the Invasive Species Centre also connects knowledge, stakeholders, and technology to prevent and reduce the spread of invasive species that can harm Canada. Today, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Kevin Irons. Mr. Kevin Irons is a large river ecologist and fisheries specialist, and he's currently the Aquaculture and Aquatic Nuisance Species Project Manager, a pro program manager for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. Today, um, he's, he's currently involved with the implementation of the Asian carp management framework to prevent Asian carp from establishing populations in the Chicago area waterways and in Lake Michigan. He also sits on the Great Lakes and Mississippi River Basin panels on aquatic nuisance species, and he co-chairs the, the Monitoring and Response Work Group as part of the Asian Carp Regional Coordinated Committee and the Council of Great Lakes Governors uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Task Force. He has also authored or co-authored over 16 peer-reviewed publications, and he serves as an incident commander for rapid response situations which may arise involving aquatic invasive species. Today, Kevin is going to talk to us about the multi-jurisdictional approach to Asian carp in the Upper Illinois River and Chicago area waterway system. Kevin, please feel free to go ahead and uh, after afterward we're going to have a question and answer period and uh, Kevin will try and answer as many questions as possible within the time allowed. Kevin, over to you. Thank you, Christine, um, and, and first thank you for hosting along with uh, uh, the Invasive Species Center um, and, and your work, uh, your cooperative work with us here in the U.S. Um, certainly I'm, I'm following uh, big coattails. Becky Cudmore explained uh, a lot of uh, what Canada's up to, and uh, we hope to follow up that uh, basically with, with what we're doing here in the U.S., and I'll briefly talk a little bit about some of the biology uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, that helps guide our actions here in the U.S. Um, and end up just kind of uh, broadly telling you what we're up to and uh, at least at a 30,000 foot level um, you may have questions at the end uh, that we can drill down even further if you like. I'm glad to do that. Um, certainly I, I'll advertise it now verbally but uh, my email is just my name, Kevin Irons, Kevin Irons at Illinois.gov and uh, certainly available to, uh, to talk offline afterwards for any of those important questions. Well, Christine talked about quite a bit of my work, and I'm not, I'm not trying to brag, but, but we're very um, uh, busy in the state of Illinois and really across the Great Lakes Basin um, on, on the work we're doing in the, uh, in the context of invasive species and Asian carp specifically. Um, as she mentioned, I, I work closely with the ACRCC. Uh, but also I've been working closely with Michigan and the other Great Lakes states and provinces uh, as part of a Council of Great Lakes Governors, and of course that includes the premiers, and uh, it's an AIS task force, an Aquatic Invasive Species Task Force. Um, one of the key things we've done over the last uh, year and a half is, is put together a mutual aid agreement, a way that we can work together across the basin um, when, when a need exists that we can act together and we have the support of our governors and premiers. That's huge in, in this uh, arena of aquatic invasive species, that we can bring our resources uh, to help each other out. So uh, that, that is really good work, and it's only because of the work of, from all the representatives across the basin not that that's possible. Um, but I also get to work on the Great Lakes panel and the Mississippi River Basin panel on aquatic nuisance species. Certainly in the Great Lakes we're worried about uh, a new player, Asian carp, possibly getting to the Great Lakes. But of course on the Mississippi River we have uh, not only Asian carp but all these other ones, but we're trying to manage or control or mit otherwise mitigate Asian, Asian carp in, in that basin. So uh, 
very similar topics, a little different uh, angle. Um, I also get to work on a national level with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies to, to really talk about policy that we can be consistent across uh, the nation here in the U.S. And uh, that can drill down to the Midwest Governors Association as well, looking at the large basin, the Mississippi River Basin. Um, obviously, I, I think introduced um, critters are, are an increasing topic, and, and we're really happy that they're taking the, uh, the, the spotlight and actually some funding that we can get some needed work done. As we transition over to really talking about carp, uh, I, I do this with, with a lot of my public uh, speaking venues. We're not necessarily talking about grandpa's carp. You know, if I, if I say I'm, I'm, if we have a, an Asian carp issue, someone gives me the story, oh, grandpa used to catch that back in the day, and it was a, a fish. We liked it or didn't like it. Uh, but nonetheless, a common carp obviously has been in our uh, continent for over 100 years. Brought in the 1880s and, and in a Johnny Appleseed fashion, sprinkled across the U.S. Uh, in, in Canada uh, because the European settlers like this fish. They're very familiar with it. And uh, so it's been around a while and probably has a bad name. I often refer to carp as being a four-letter word. And uh, Asian carp um, are much different in many ways, and we'll touch on those briefly. Uh, when we talk about Asian carp, we're talking about four species. These are the, the three most common ones. And uh, I'll, I'll give you the perspective. Uh, the big head carp is on the bottom. Um, and it grows the largest, up to nearly 100 pounds. The silver carp are those jumping fish that we see in the videos. Uh, unfortunately, I can't show you any of those today because uh, we don't want the system to crash. Uh, but the silver carp don't grow quite as big, but their jumping ability, hitting people, boats, um, really has taken over YouTube. Um, that's what people most recognize as Asian carp now, I think. Uh, and finally, the grass carp, uh, used by management agencies, especially in, in the the Midwest or southern U.S. Um, obviously eats vegetation, has the larger scales, uh, but also can grow quite large, 70 to, to 80 pounds, uh, some of the larger individuals. Uh, there is a fourth I mentioned, black carp. Uh, they're a snail-eating carp. Uh, look very similar to the grass carp uh, and used in southern uh, U.S. aquaculture uh, today because they still stand as probably the best way to control uh, snails in aquaculture. Um, the other thing is, is, of course, chemicals. And when you have a fish uh, that you hope to get into the human uh, market for, for consumption, using chemicals is, is frowned upon. So, so the biological control is still being used in the southern U.S. Now, for really for the rest of the, the talk, I'll be talking primarily about big head carp and silver carp. Uh, big head carp on the left of your screen and silver carp to the right are those Asian carps that people are really uh, – uh, congealed upon it as being something they want to stop from, from getting into the Great Lakes. Uh, you can see their distribution uh, throughout the Mississippi River Basin. Um, you can note in the Lake Erie there have been uh, about three, three to five individuals caught. These are all been large individuals. And probably because of, of a large live food market back in the, the mid uh, to early 2000s, um, around the Toronto area actually, about $5 million a year economy on bringing live big head carp uh, for those Chinese and ethnic groups that, that like these fish. Um, all, you know, large cities around the Great Lakes uh, on the U.S. side also probably have these live fish in market, and a few of those found their ways in the Lake Erie. We don't think they swam directly there, but, but it is good to note that they're large and doing quite well um, in, in a lake uh, like Lake Erie. We would expect them to do very well, too. Uh, no silver carp have been found in the Great Lakes. Uh, grass carp have been found, and uh, we'll, we'll keep that for another discussion. So historically, they were brought over. Let me back up. Historically, they were brought over in the 1970s uh, for use in aquaculture to control algae. Um, problems in, in generally catfish ponds. They quickly got out, even in the 70s, being found in, in streams of southern U.S. And here we are today where, where they really have gone uh, up the Missouri and the Mississippi and the Ohio rivers quite well. So if I look in, on the Illinois River, so, so that's that river that connects the Great Lakes to uh, the, the broader Mississippi River Basin. Uh, we, we've seen since 2000 uh, a pretty large incline and reproduction of big head and silver carp. 
Uh, this is from a, a long-term monitoring program. Uh, it's called the Lagrange Reach, and it, it, it's the center point of the lower half of, of the uh, Illinois River. Uh, based out of Havana, the crews from here uh, do standard monitoring, electric fishing, hoop netting, uh, multiple gears annually, and they've done so since about 1990. Uh, so you can see in the early 90s or throughout the 90s, they have, there's very few fish, onesies and twosies, I call it. And in 2000, we actually saw reproduction. They had uh, significant populations where they found each other, um, and it went from just one or two fish a year to about 1,000, uh, in the case for big head carp, and 100. And you see that exponential increase. Uh, if you look at silver carp, and I'll kind of walk you through, it just went from hundreds being caught in any given year to thousands, to tens of thousands, even 100,000 uh, worth of silver, silver caught being collected. And then that was in 2008. So uh, to say they're quite abundant is an understatement. Um, our most recent assessments uh, show about 60% of the total biomass of fish populations on this section of the river being Asian carps. If I tell you 100,000 fish, sometimes we don't know what that means. So the use of videos and photographs has been very helpful. Uh, this one is, is by Chris Young of our Illinois DNR, but we most recently took NBC out on the river as Kevin Tibbles on the front of a shock boat. Um, but there's a lot of fish. Hopefully that comes through when you see these pictures. Uh, this is, thankfully, in the lower part of the Illinois River where they're most abundant. Um, but in October, we did not expect them to act like this. Certainly lots of fish. To, to put more numbers on it, we've done some market recapture uh, studies. And this is for silver carp only. And again, looking at just that Lagrange Reach, it's 80 mile long reach in the, in the lower part of the Illinois River. And you can look at numbers or uh, biomass. But uh, we can see these are these are numbers that we published back in 2007. Three to 6,000 fish per river mile. And you can multiply that out if, if you like to see the whole uh, population for that 80 mile reach, about half a million fish. Or uh, in biomass, we're talking about uh, about 13 metric tons per river mile. And these are silver carp that are really sub-adults for adults. We did not take into account any small individuals at the time, uh, young of year or fish under, say, 10 inches. So these are fish that we could put a tag in and hopefully get a recapture later. So 13 metric tons. So that, that's also another way to, to say there's a lot of fish out there. So some of the, the biological impacts that we've seen um, in, in 2000 is that benchmark that basically before Asian carp are reproducing and then afterwards is condition of some of our native fish. Uh, we chose big mouth buffalo and gizzard shad to look at, and this comes from a publication um, that came out in 2007. But, uh, but before Asian carp, the uh, fish condition was much better. Uh, for big mouth buffalo, we actually saw an overall 5% decline in, in the average condition. And that, not only did it decline, but it continued to decline um, over the, those years after Asian carp. And actually, we've seen just a, a, a slight increase in buffalo condition since this time, um, but, but not up into the pre-carp condition. The similar pattern for gizzard shad, we did not see that precipitous decline, but, but about 7% overall. Uh, mean condition uh, decrease from, from before Asian carp were established. So you can see where, where you have a much more efficient fish coming in, uh, feeding on plankton, uh, rotifers, uh, algaes, and taking those resources away from some native fish. And this is one of the first times that was documented in a wild system, an open system. So, so this is Asian carp food. It, it essentially, zooplankton is the food of preference for the big head carp and phytoplankton and the smaller stuff for silver carp. And if, it was, if they went to the supermarket, they may be buying food or something like this, essentially just uh, a green algae slurry. The way they feed it is they filter it. Uh, they have very good gill rakers. I'll show you those in a second. Uh, but this is a silver carp feeding just below the surface, and they can actively pump water from that uh, very productive part of the river. and filters to their gills, leaving the food in their uh, mouth to be swallowed, and obviously moving the, the water through and over their gills. 
Uh, you can see from the water in the background, the Illinois River is a very productive system also. Uh, so it's actually a, it's a pretty good home for these guys. So the gill rakers, obviously the red part of this slide uh, is the gills and allows them to respire. Um, the gill rakers are the, that structure that uh, for a big head carp looks like a barber's comb, very fine uh, slit where, where the food is filtered. Silver carp goes one step further and it looks more like a sponge. So big head carp can filter down to maybe uh, 20 microns or silver carp, maybe 5 to 10 microns. In addition to the, the structure, it does have that, the slimy coating that also entraps food items and then it sloughs off and they can swallow it. So very efficient at getting those smallest particles out of our river um, and we've already seen that they've you know, been able to affect some native, native species. And we already talked about numbers, but if you look at all the mouths of silver carp across the landscape here, uh, you get to multiply out each of those fish taking food. Uh, we've got lots of these fish, again, 60% of the biomass, they can affect the Illinois River uh, biologically, ecologically. Certainly why we're all concerned about letting them into the next great uh, ecosystem, the Great Lakes, is uh, they've already been impacted by things like zebra mussels, quagga mussels, not only sea lamprey, but alewife, many things that eat plankton resources, and uh, this would certainly take that underbelly away. So not only do uh, Asian carp affect native fish, uh, we've seen them affect themselves, and over time, and this is just from the Illinois River, uh, but we've seen it in other rivers like the Missouri, the Mississippi, and the Ohio as well, um, we see a decrease in overall condition uh, of the big head and silver carp, the invading fish themselves. Uh, becoming very robust when they first come out. They're, obviously, their numbers are lower overall, and we see a, a, a decline uh, to less than what one would be basically an average condition. Um, we see some of these in, in rivers like the Missouri be quite low, maybe 0.8, and uh, actually cause an extinction event on the Missouri River where big head carp were, were rare or not even been able to be found. Unfortunately, in the Missouri River, because it is so long, uh, upstream populations spawn the, the next year and repopulate it. So we, we started to cycle over. We haven't come to any um, similar extinction type events in the Illinois River, perhaps because we're much more uh, uh, nutrient rich. An another unique thing on the Illinois River um, is that we've seen multiple spawns in, in any given year, and we've seen lots of years with no spawns at all. Uh, this is from 2007. Not only were we seeing a, a results of uh, young of year from early uh, July being present, but in, in August we found eggs as well. So we, we, there was evidence of at least three successful spawning peaks in 20, uh, 2007. The following year, 2008, it was probably the most successful spawn, but it was one spawn and one spawn only, uh, and that was in June. Uh, so they're very plastic and adaptable uh, species. Uh, they can uh, invade quite well, but we're very thankful we don't have consistent spawning every year. And that's important to understand when we're doing our modeling and um, our removal that they may not spawn in any given year. It's very, very closely um, connected with the hydrograph, uh, rain events, and uh, how the water is moving down the river. So initially, back in the 90s and 2000s, in addition to the monitoring that was going on by people at the Illinois River Biological Station with that long-term monitoring, um, Asian carp did come on to, to the radar. And uh, a barrier panel that was convened trying to put an electric barrier near Chicago, uh, initially for round gobies in the Great Lakes. We wanted to keep them from uh, coming into the Mississippi River. Of course, government moves quite slowly at times, and by the time actually things got in the water, carp was more of a threat, actually, because the gobies had already been found 7 to 10 miles downstream in, in fairly good numbers. But in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, we were talking about these things. Illinois DNR, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District uh, of Chicago, along with the Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Chicago, we were out monthly looking with uh, trammel nets and electric fishing to see if fish are approaching that area of, of uh, Brandon Road Pool or Lockport Pool where the electric barrier is. 
uh, to make sure we're starting to get some information about what's going on up there. We also use minnow spikes looking for small fish. Certainly worried about large numbers of little guys uh, getting up in that area. This initial monitoring was just focused directly below the electric barrier, and uh, it was just that uh, pulse um, of carp that we wanted to look for. We were catching gobies and looking for other things, but but we had not uh, been catching any uh, big head or silver carp, which is which is good. Things began uh, to escalate a little bit more in 2009. We had electric barriers in place. We'll talk a little bit more about what that fish fence uh, looks like and, and the, the structure of that. But carp numbers downstream were increasing. Uh, we show a picture of, of carp jumping. The YouTube videos were, were being shared. And the OMG moment was, are they jumping into Lake Michigan into this next great ecosystem? Another thing that was going on is that we had that initial barrier um, up and running, but it required to be shut down uh, for maintenance. It had to be shut all the way down to get some needed work done. Um, so what if fish were there? What was going to happen? So we had a lack of knowledge beside the, the initial, you know, the monthly sampling. Um, and finally, a, a new tool was coming in uh, detecting eDNA, environmental DNA, right below the electric barrier. And uh, they were looking and they found silver carp eDNA. So something had to happen in 2009 before shutting off what is our only uh, uh, barrier at the time. Uh, we'll, we'll hear more about eDNA in some upcoming um, talks, but, but very simply, it was taking basically half a gallon or two liters of water from the environment in the upper right-hand corner, taking it back to the lab and filtering it uh, onto a, a piece of, of paper, uh, a filter, and then running the, the DNA and detecting or not detecting fish. Um, that, that's a very simple overview. Uh, but kind of CSI. We've all seen how DNA is used at a crime scene, and uh, this was, was telling us that DNA may be around um, the electric barrier. So we're, we're very nervous. The reason that we're, we're ex extremely nervous about eDNA being there, and this is the area we're talking about, this is where the electric barrier is, um, is because of the connection with the Great Lakes. And so I, I thought I'd give you just quick history lesson. Back in the 1900s, these basins were essentially separated. The Plains River came down and uh, joined the Kankakee River to form the Illinois River at that, pla at that, that point, uh, some 35 miles or so from, from Lake Michigan. But we had a problem in that time that we had pollution rampant in Chicago. Um, a lot of their effluents from uh, sewer, basically open sewers, were put in places like the Chicago River. And the Calumet River, this flow went out into Lake Michigan, like many cities uh, at that time. However, their drinking water then came from Lake Michigan and went back to the city. So we had a great disease problem. The, the Corps of Engineers came through and, and made a tremendous uh, engineering effort, basically reversed the Chicago River, allowing that pollution essentially to go downstream, also diverting some of the Lake Michigan water, because uh, we know dilution is the solution to pollution, right? And, but, but it essentially connected these two great watersheds. Now, for a long time, that was not a problem because these waters were so polluted, and essentially 50 to 100 miles downstream, um, aquatic life was imperiled, and uh, we didn't have back and forth movement of, of critters at all. Um, however, you know, with the Clean Water Act that, that came around in the 60s and the 70s in the U.S., these waters began to clean. Downriver fish populations have increased. And, and today, um, the sport fishery and, and uh, the native fish communities uh, throughout the Illinois River are, are quite fantastic. Uh, but it allows this connection where fish can move back and forth. So there are about 70 miles worth of canals above the electric barrier. And this is one, one place that we do a lot of our work and initially started in, in 2009. But when these barriers were going down, we, we were certainly concerned about any possible fish below moving up into the watershed. And it's a, it's a large uh, canal. Uh, people, people don't think of, of, of these ditches or, or canals. Well, you might be able to, to fill them in or uh, do something like that, and, and you may. But, but the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal is quite large when compared to other canals. And 
in the, in the, in the world. The Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, the Welland or the Erie Canal uh, are much smaller than the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal and, and certainly a vibrant part of the Chicago uh, economy as well as uh, continuing to be uh, part of that pollution control uh, that has not gone away as well as things like uh, flooding control. Um, when you get water in Chicago it runs off because of all the uh, concrete and, and goes downstream. So uh, a very critical part of the infrastructure of, of Northeast Illinois. So in that area uh, where they put the electric barriers here, you can see the, the, the first of the barriers is called a demonstration barrier. Uh, was put in 2002. It, essentially, this is just putting cables in the bottom of the river, putting enough electricity to, to, to stop fish, much like a cattle fence. Um, and, and both independent and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, show that it's very effective at, at keeping fish from moving across. And since they've upgraded a, a couple times um, to put additional barriers to the point where uh, there's power in the water almost continuously with uh, with all three barriers working at once. Um, so if there is a, an outage, and these are on different uh, power supplies, so something would happen, um, the other two would remain in effect, as well as having on-site on uh, generators. Or for moments that they're required. Uh, this demonstration barrier is scheduled to be replaced and put up in this general area. Uh, it'll be called barrier one. So the barriers are really important um, as part of our strategy in keeping potential fish from moving. And in 2009, because of all the stuff we just talked about, eDNA and the need for uh, fixing it, we came in and uh, applied rote notes. Uh, for about seven miles of this canal uh, to make sure there was no fish. Uh, because we did that, we actually did found one big head carp. Remember, eDNA was, was suggesting silver carp in the area, but we found uh, one big head carp, uh, a small fish, but it was below the electric barrier. Uh, a lot of effort went in to get that one fish, uh, over 12,000 person hours. Uh, and, and that was actually in 2010, I apologize. But, but a lot of effort went in below there. In the following spring, 2010, uh, we went above the electric barrier with additional amount of, of work. Um, and because of eDNA and suspicion, uh, we, we increased, uh, or we did another rote known event, 2.6 miles uh, were treated. Uh, no big head or silver carp were collected in that event. Now we also started using commercial fishers. And uh, in the spring of 2010, the very first day, using uh, contracted commercial fishers above the electric barrier, we caught one big head carp. So those two account for the only fish ever caught um, directly below or above the electric barrier. That has not changed to this date. Since 2010, however, we, we've ramped up our efforts significantly. Um, we're doing monitoring uh, because of a, a Great Lakes restoration initiative that allowed funding to come to protect the Great Lakes. Uh, that's outlined in an Asian carp control strategy framework. Um, and then it, it boils down into a monitoring and response plan, uh, which we have annually. And it has up to uh, 20, 21 different projects um, that basically is work above or directly below the electric barrier to make sure uh, fish aren't even approaching the electric barrier. And then finally, annually, we come out with a summary of that re of the plan's results. Um, so in 2013, we come up with an interim uh, summary report to tell us what happened the year before. Uh, what were what were the fact-finding episodes? How many fish did we see? Where did we sample? Uh, what Where is the science going? And uh, this is all available on asiancarp.us. Um, you can get on there and see what we're up to. Again, we have 21 different projects, 75 project objectives, um, and that's all in our monitoring response plan. Um, within that plan, there are six monitoring projects, and that's both using fixed and random sites above and below uh, the barrier. We do fixed site sampling and random site sampling. Uh, we're looking for small fish. We're looking for um, juvenile fish in, in you know, the gears that collect those in different locations. And we're trying to uh, look at distribution and movement of both juvenile 
and uh, young of your Asian carps in the Illinois waterway to, to predict risk at the electric barrier. We also have five uh, removal projects um, that are looking um, it's also uh, includes response actions and a cause. When we suspect something to happen, we've been out there uh, lots, dozens of times. We saw a fish or we have suspicion of a fish, either because of eDNA or a report, and uh, all the agencies um, respond and work together uh, to see if, that, if there's any science behind that uh, report. We do planned uh, seasonal surveillance above, above the electric barrier, which is included in that. Uh, removal project. We also have four barrier effectiveness projects, looking at the barriers and how, are they doing the job that uh, we think they are. And we have four gear effectiveness evaluations. We're looking for fish, removing fish, are we doing it with the right gears? And we also have two alternative pathway surveillance, um, using law enforcement, um, looking in places like urban ponds. Uh, where fish may uh, come up in stocking events or have come up historically in stocking events. Uh, we're looking for those, too. We can shut the front door, but we definitely don't want them going around the back door either. So it's a very robust plan. The overall goals, um, I have them out here, but just basically five objectives. One, determine the distribution of carp in the Chicago area waterway system, and then use that to help inform um, our plan and any, any response or removal action. And also removal of any Asian carp found um, in the cause to, to the maximum extent, extent practicable. If there's one fish out there, we're trying to find that thing and make sure it doesn't have a chance to, to spread. We also want to find any vulnerabilities in our current systems and barriers and, and also determine the leading edge of, of the Asian carp population. Are they at the barrier? Are they somewhere else? Um, and, and what's the strategy to keep them uh, at bay. And we also want to un, uh, improve our understanding of factors behind the likelihood that Asian carp could become established in the Great, Great Lakes. So if we look at all the information that we've collected, um, I can give you a kind of a, a quick update. Uh, thankfully, we do not see them in the Chicago area waterway system. Only that one individual was caught up here, and, and uh, actually we think it may have been an escapee from one of these ponds that were stocked. They probably got out in the system and, and ended up in this lake where we found it. It did not have the history of something that was in the Illinois River that migrated up and through. Uh, we can do that through some microchemistry. Uh, glad to answer questions about that later. Um, here is where the electric barriers are. And if you go downstream, again, where the, the Kankakee River and the Des Plaines River come together to form the Illinois, that's the, the place where we will start getting a handful of fish. Uh, with all the effort that we do, again, it's a combined effort with Fish and Wildlife Service, um, the Illinois DNR, our contract and commercial fishers, um, and other staff that are out in the water. USGS uh, is part of our technology team. This is below Brandon Road Lock and Dam, uh, and actually uh, we just get a few fish down at the lower part of that reach. Now if we go down below um, Dresden Island Lock and Dam here, we, we get a more moderate population. We have fish here um, that we can catch on a routine basis. We don't see any reproduction up here. There's no uh, successful reproduction. Although we've seen a spawning run, so to speak, we've never seen any eggs or young of your fish, uh, even though we're looking for them. So you have to go all the way down to Henry, Illinois, and, and we're actually about 143 miles from Lake Michigan at that point. But uh, that's where we start picking up some young of your fish. So our sustainable spawning population is well downstream in the Illinois River. Um, also, we are watching that black carp, and we've had a couple of those uh, occurrences in the southern part of, Lake, of the Illinois River. So that kind of gives you an overview of where the fish are. We have an adult population here. And that's why we think a strategy of contracted removal with fishermen um, is possible. And today we've taken 2.6 million pounds of fish from this upper Illinois River. And that's part of the strategy of keeping them from advancing any farther up, challenging the electric barrier. All of our um, Sampling results, when we, whether you're talking about the Chicago area waterway system, our contracted removal, or um, some population assessments downstream, are put up monthly on AsianCarp.us. You can follow this link 
Uh, you can go to agentcarp.us and look for uh, monthly updates. And it's under current action. And uh, just select the month that you want to see the, the updates. And all the agencies that are working together on this, uh, including Ontario and DFO Canada, will uh, will post things and we'll have them up there on a monthly basis. So you can see what we've been doing, what we've been finding. So, so basically, we've got a three-tier or a three-varying uh, uh, approach. We're looking in Chicago for any rare fish or to say things have changed uh, since 2010. And this is our fourth year. Uh, we started out. This was the focus. We spent all of our time up here doing less work downstream. In 2014, because of all of that, uh, tens of thousands of hours, uh, we go up here both spring and fall and repeat all those collections. Um, over 300 electric fishing runs, over 300 um, net sets uh, to confirm that nothing has changed. And we're looking for those rare fish above the electric barrier. Uh, we're doing much more work now below uh, because we're taking the fight to the fish. We want to find out more about that leading edge uh, and where that is. Um, this is the upper Illinois River. We're looking for contracted removal and detecting that uh, population from. Southern Illinois University is, is doing work downstream to, to basically tell us the, the population overall. Um, and this is a place where uh, commercial fishermen can actually fish at large and for profit and um, catch Asian carp as well as uh, some commercial native species. So in the cause sampling, we do have fixed sites um, from the shores of Lake Michigan down into the canal and uh, from Lake Calumet. Uh, below O'Brien Lock. We go to those uh, both in the spring and summer now. Uh, we are doing that monthly in the early years of our monitoring, uh, 10, 2010, 2011, and 2012. We also do random sites that fill in the gaps um, here. So we're catching the 70 miles worth of canal quite well with uh, electrofishing and netting efforts. Um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is also doing eDNA analysis and uh, telling us what that uh, means on a basis of the changing over time. So this talks about our seasonal intensive monitoring in the Chicago area waterways. We're, we're, we got out there in June and September, and we had eDNA monitoring going out the weeks prior to that. Um, and this is a cooperative uh, event, Illinois DNR, Fish and Wildlife Service, Corps of Engineers, and our contracted fishers are going out. Uh, I should mention our contracted fishermen are really people who have fished all their lives, um, but they have a biologist on board too. Not only are they good at catching these fish, but we have a biologist on board to, to capture the information on how they're catching it and what gear they're using. During these events in 2014, over 400 trammel and gill nets were set, that's about 50 miles worth of net, and 350 electric fishing runs at, at both the fixed and random sites were done. We also pulled uh, 200, two 800-yard seine hauls, and that was in Lake Calumet, the location of the, where that big head carp was found back in 2010. Uh, it is very uh, nutrient-rich, green water. It is carpy-looking water, so we do a little extra work in there. Uh, in all, we've caught 22,000 fish, over 50 species, um, one hybrid, no big head or, or silver carp have been detected. Now as we go downstream, uh, the, the role of our commercial fishers is more important. We call this barrier defense. We're defending the barrier, uh, sometimes with removal of fish, and this is a typical commercial uh, boat with one biologist and two uh, commercial fishermen. Unfortunately, you see our problem with Phragmites and purple loose stripe here behind the, the fishermen. Once they catch these fish, um, the big head and silver carp come back and are thrown in the back of a truck and uh, removed from the waterway. In fact, the, the company that's providing the removal right now is making a liquid fish fertilizer. So um, in all, we've, we've been fishing with our commercial guys. Over 1,000 miles of nets have been deployed in that part of the upper Illinois waterway. 2.6 million pounds of fish have been removed. Uh, the good news is between our sampling and that and prior to the ACRCC getting involved, uh, we have not seen that leading edge move since 2006. So for about eight years, things have not changed. We're, we're very thankful, and we're trying to figure that out. In fact, USGS, um, 
University of Illinois and Illinois DNR were, were, were uh, discussing why is that uh, happening? Why aren't they going up farther? And maybe there's something inherent in the, in the watershed itself. To summarize our, our removal of, of just here in, in 2014, we've taken out an additional 50,000 fish. Uh, that's about 250 tons. We, we are using other gears, too, instead of the typical gill nets and trammel nets. Here's a uh, seine. This is one of those 800-yard uh, seines, nearly half a mile long. And uh, they spread it all the way across the lake and pull the fish in. Uh, some of those catches can range over 50,000 fish in one haul. And uh, it, it can be a good way to do that. We try to do this in the wintertime. Obviously, in Illinois, we're somewhat warmer, but not all winters uh, are conducive. So. When, when there's ice in the water, it's very tough. This is a proud biologist, Blake Rubush. Um, we caught 50,000 pounds in, in this haul. So is it working? We're, 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 we've removed 2.6 million pounds, and these are our commercial catches over a couple years, just to show that we, we do see a trend of decreasing uh, fish. Although we, we also see things like uh, catching being better in the spring and the fall. So we we're actually changing our, our strategy and doing more fishing in the spring and fall. Um, also something to know is that although these numbers are lower, we're actually doing more and I think more efficient work uh, because we're communicating with uh, the hydroacoustic teams that are out there. They'll, they'll tell us where there's a lot of fish and our commercial guys will, will chase after them. So we're becoming more efficient. So we should see this number increase, but it's, it's still decreasing. So that's telling us uh, there may be some success. Um, certainly, I understand that there's challenges to assessing these large populations in the wild uh, with commercial gear alone. Uh, for, for people concerned about the native fish, 78% of, of the things we catch in those commercial gears are Asian carp. Uh, other commercial species, large-bodied uh, suckers, common carp, uh, are about 19% of that catch. 2% are some game fish, uh, but these gill nets and, and nets aren't dead set. They're only set for uh, half an hour to 45 minutes at a time. Um, all those other species are, are removed and then put back into the water. Uh, so only, they think uh, the impact is very small, and, and most of these fish do quite well after being released. So the other things um, what we're trying to do, we're bringing uh, Southern Illinois University on board to look at the population from a scientific point of view, not just commercial catches, looking at things like immigration, emigration, natural mortality, harvest mortality, and we can do very well. In some years, we've seen uh, the harvest mortality be up to about 80%. Um, and some years, they're smaller, and we see increased immigration. So we're, we're trying to come together on what the population is doing you know, and how, how we can affect that population. Uh, the way they do that is with the hydroacoustics is running up and down the river. In 2011, it was about 3,400 kilometers sampled of these transects, and we actually went into the backwaters in 2012. We're trying to do that at low water so we can, we can see all the fish and see what, what the population looks like. Now we're doing mark and recapture. Here's a commercial fisherman with one of our recaptured fish, and uh, they get quite competitive at how many of those little bands they can they can get. But all those are individually numbered. It also adds to our model of, of population, the fish in the upper river as well as uh, the lower river. We do have a model. Michigan State University uh, was a partner with Southern Illinois University to come up with a model of fish, and they say it's going to be really hard to fish them to extinction. Um, however, I think there's a lot of good news here that we can significantly change the population, perhaps up to 50 percent uh, by commercial fishing. And this was a, a basic model, lots of assumptions, so we're trying to uh, fine-tune it uh, with another simple model. Model people think this is simple, but there's lots of interactions that we uh, just took out of the literature for that first approach, and we're trying to understand that this is going to be a spatially explicit movement model. Where in the river the fish are, we want to understand the population there, and then their um, desire to move upstream, ultimately to have a risk analysis um, at the electric barrier. We know where the populations of fish are, what's the risk at the electric barrier, and what are those things we can do well, through harvest and targeted harvest to, to uh, 
uh, reduce that risk even further. One thing we did, we wanted to make sure that, uh, that removal of fish was a, was a right pack. Um, Southern Illinois University um, worked with commercial fishermen. They removed 3 million pounds of fish from the lower Illinois River uh, as part of a meal order, a uh, fish meal order. Um, and, and for just taking 3 million pounds, now this is a place of, on the river that we already take 7 million pounds out annually by commercial uh, means. By increasing that and by 3 million pounds, we've seen change in the population size structure, the relative abundance of fish in that area, and the sex rate ratios have changed. So it gives us some uh, hopeful uh, advances that we can uh, fish and change the population farther downstream uh, for the better bit of the, the ecosystem. So ultimately, a lot of the things we're, we're finding, the catch rates are decreasing. Um, silver carp numbers are smaller. And uh, the leading edge hasn't changed. Uh, some of the results that we can influence, uh, larger populations is very promising. And we haven't found any fish above the electric barrier since that first one, and only one, caught in 2010. And, and no big head or silver carp in Lake Michigan. These other things I'm going to go through a little bit quicker, but some, we're looking at unconventional, unconventional gears, uh, bringing large Great Lakes style trap nets into uh, our river system. Can that increase our uh, odds of catching fish? Certainly we can leave these trap nets in place for long periods of time, uh, over 100 days, and just go back and catch fish. So if we're looking for rare fish, this may be a good tool, as this proved quite effective at catching big heads and silver carp. Next slide. I've got an error that the go-to meeting is not responding. Okay. <coughs> Do you want to try that again? I uh, won't move. Can someone else move the slide? I will move it for you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so the water gun development, this is a cannon or a, a boomer, or it's basically making a loud uh, sound pressure in the water. Uh, it both can kill small fish, <coughs> and I think it's going to be highly affecting at moving fish in a watershed. So uh, we're using uh, water gun development with USGS. Next slide. Looking at urban ponds across the, the Chicago area, those closest to like Michigan, uh, we've taken fish out of uh, this big head and silver carp out of these watersheds. Uh, next slide. Some of those quite large, 72 pound big head carp. It was in that pond for a long time. They basically come up here probably with channel cat stockings maybe uh, 15 years ago. The next slide. Those other pathways we're beginning to look um, with our law enforcement to make sure they're not in our live food markets. Um, and, and we're working very closely with our conservation police officers. Next slide. And we're looking at places with the CPOs and biologists to make sure they're not in our live bait either. We have not found any in live bait. Next slide. I hope it's coming across that we're integrating our pest management issues quite well. Um, it's kind of a funny thing whether it's integrated pest management or integrated pest management. Um, but, but nonetheless, we're bringing expertises from across the disciplines together uh, to fight these uh, nuisance species in a new and unique way to make us more efficient. Yeah, next slide. We're using things like carbon dioxide. We know it, we can move fish quite well with carbon dioxide. We're investigating the use of carbon dioxide as a barrier, um, perhaps in a lock chamber or below a lock chamber. Next. We understand commercial efforts are a, a great way from looking at China. Um, they're really good and delicious food and uh, low in contaminants when compared to other things, more like farmed catfish than tuna or roughy. And this is just mercury. Next slide. And nature tells us they taste good. Okay, next slide. And I want to go through this very quickly. Eurasian rust, um, 
is something else that and I wanted to, is we're changing from Asian carp, but I want to demonstrate the, the basin is working together. Um, another species coming down the Great Lake. Next slide. We use eDNA again to say, are they moving? And initially, no. Next slide. However, under a, a kind of closer examination, we actually found it in Illinois water, Illinois and Indiana waters, and uh, basically uh, created a, a response. Next slide. We brought people from across the Great Lakes, including Indiana and Illinois. Uh, we brought people from Michigan and other states uh, through an incident command structure. And we, we sampled for Eurasian rough um, because of those couple eDNA positive. Thankfully, no rough were found. And we're uh, maintaining vigilance and looking for fish in that area. Next slide. Essentially, here we caught a lot of fish. No rough, but we found things like gobies and and other bad players. Uh, so we'll continue to work with our, our partners on that. But this was the first use of a mutual aid agreement in to work on our Great Lakes. So we're very proud of that effort. Next slide. Ultimately, we're trying to keep the Great Lakes from looking like this in regards to grass carp and some pretty cool um, photo shopping. Next. Um, and it's not possible unless we have the, the use and the friendship of all of our partners. Uh, so Ontario and Canada is part of that. Our federal partners and our researchers here in Illinois have made all this work possible. So we're very thankful for their help. Next slide. And my last slide would be just to, to remind people to be a hero, transport zero. So we, we reach out to our recreational water users and tell them they can help us by not moving things around the landscape. And we're trying to do um, more new and unique ways to reach them with the same message. Because uh, we may be able to stop them in aquatic ways, but we don't want them to go around the back door. I think you have one more slide, Christine. I do. Uh, my, yeah. con my contact information. Um, I'm always uh, willing to, to answer questions. I know I ran a little bit long on some of the details, but uh, uh, either by telephone or by email, I can answer any subsequent questions. Well, I think we have a couple minutes left if you wanted to answer uh, one or two questions. I know there has Absolutely. been a few typed into the uh, question box. So I'm going to read a couple for you if you wouldn't mind answering. That would be great. Yep, thank you. Um, one question was that uh, even though there's been programs in place since 2006 for monitoring the ballast water to prevent invasive species, what's the probability of Asian carp eggs or young coming into the Great Lakes uh, via the ballast water discharge in the future? Sure. Um, I think it's very low. You know, the probability can't ever really approach a zero. But, but one of our partners, the U.S. Coast Guard, actually did a study to look at uh, can eggs and larvae from places where they reproduce, the lower Illinois or Mississippi River, get into the, to the, the holding places in, in, in barges. Not quite ballast, and they don't have the pumping system uh, that, ba that Lakers or ocean-going vessels have? The short answer is yes, they can get in there and actually survive. Um, certainly larval fish have been found in there uh, doing quite nicely. However, these ballast areas have to, you have to put a pump down in there and actually physically put the pump in and, and pump the water out. One, there's regulations that says moving ballast across the electric barrier uh, is not permitted. But two, in that pumping process, it kills virtually all of these larval fish that comes out. Um, so yes, it's possible. Uh, we think that the impact and risk is very low. OK, great. Um, also, uh, for any imports of live fish, can the Michigan and Illinois governments make it a requirement that all fish must be tagged? And would that help to identify where any live fish caught came from, where, that were caught where, where they came from? Uh, possibly. No, you cannot move, any, in Michigan and Illinois specifically, you cannot move any live big head or silver carp legally. Um, obviously, we're looking at that very closely. Uh, we think we know fish have been, have been found at the Canadian-U.S. border, and uh, we're working on you know, ways to regulate that. I know Ontario is also uh, very interested in that thing. But, but no, I mean, legal movement of live fish is not happening, so, so we have to work on, on the ones that aren't so above board. 
Okay. Um, and I would like to remind anyone who's still on, on the webinar that if you do have a question, we have a couple minutes left if you wanted to type it into the question box and I will read them as they come up. Um, okay, another question for you, Kevin. Does Canada have a real voice in the decision-making process on what will be done to mitigate the threat of uh, in the Chicago waterway where, and how that, what that poses? Um, since Canada will have uh, to live with the potentially catastrophic result of any inaction or inadequate action, shouldn't it have a legitimate say in what takes place? Absolutely, and the short answer is specifically for our work as it's funded through the GLRI and the ACRCC, they're now, both Ontario and DFO Canada, are, are part of that process. Uh, they have reviewed our plans and worked up, I think, favorably. Uh, I know uh, we've had DFO Canada to Illinois and shown them what we're up to and even train, cross-trained some of their staff. Now, if you want to come, if you want to know how to catch Asian carp, come to Illinois and we'll share our expertise and hopefully you'll never catch one in, in, in the Great Lakes. So um, informally, I, I talk very well across the basin. That's, that's part of what I do. And um, uh, we take all comments uh, very, very seriously. To even further that is that we're, we're starting a relationship with China, a place that have these fish for thousands of years, to further identify ways you know, catching or otherwise removing fish um, beyond what we've already recognized. Okay. Um, another question. You talked about a hybrid fish that was caught during your monitoring study um, during the webinar. and. Uh, what, what was that hybrid fish? Oh, it, it may have been a bluegill green sunfish hybrid. I, I can't tell you that right, exactly right now. Uh, unfortunately, we, we catch other invasive fish or non-native fish, uh, things like tilapia, uh, silver arowana. Some, some of these things are either in aquaculture or, uh, frankly, in the aquarium industry. Uh, we found those in the cause, too. Most of them don't stand a chance of surviving a, an Illinois winter. Um, but it's, it's starting to guide our policy. We're, we're making sure we treat things like tilapia as restricted species. And um, for those people trying to raise them, uh, make sure they're not being dumped in the, in the canal and, and track that better. Um, question about the electric barrier. Um, is it 100% effective 24-7? What happens if there is a power outage or flooding? Or are there alternative solutions? Well, yeah, there are, we're, we're concerned about that. The nice thing is that we have multiple barriers on at once, and we wouldn't expect them all to go off at once. Um, is anything 100% effective? Uh, probably not. Uh, we, we definitely know small fish are less prone to electricity than larger fish. And uh, so that's why we do so much monitoring. Uh, thankfully, we don't feel that there's a high risk of big head or silver carp uh, directly below the barrier, and we're there throughout the summer every couple of weeks, and we're, we look at that area very intensely. Um, but the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is, is leading that project, and I know they've got people uh, working with the Fish and Wildlife Service about effectiveness, and uh, can a fish get pushed through by barges? So those are things that are on our radar, and can we manipulate the electricity to make improvements? I think yes, and how do we do that? Um, they're working on it. So, but I think it's very very effective. You know, I, I don't know if I can put a number on it. If it's 90 percent or 95 or 98, um, fish, fish aren't streaming through that area. And we've got thousands or millions of tagged fish uh, identification, and none of them have gone through from downstream to upstream. We're very thankful for that. Okay, good to know. Okay, I think we're out of time now, so I'd just like to say on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank you, Kevin, for this uh, exciting and informative presentation about Asian carps and what's going on down in your area in Chicago, Illinois. Um, I'd encourage anyone to please visit our website at uh, www.asiancarp.ca to look for any more information, and also Kevin has a the website that he put up, it's asiancart.us to see more specifically what's happening in the U.S. Uh, please come back for more webinars. Uh, we have one on November 25th about Canada's Asian Carp Early Detection Monitoring Program. And another was going to be on December 3rd. Um, and it's going to be on Canadian research in support of the Asian Carp Management Programs. 
Um, just a reminder as well, this webinar has been recorded and it will be up on the Asian Carp Canada website. Uh, sometime next week it should be available under the resources tab. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Uh, everyone have a great day. Hope to see you at the next one.